welcome back everybody to another indie MMO devlog. This week I wanted to work on adding user accounts, so to do that we will use this package, Goth, which gives you basically like an OAuth wrapper layer for all of these different providers. So they'll log in through OAuth and then I'll get an OAuth token and then I'll use that as a cookie to authorize and authenticate the user. And then on the back end I'll have to make some changes where I will use some sort of internal user ID to look up that user's information so that that way I can keep some persistence in the game. Uh, like if the player has things in their inventory, those will no longer get deleted when they log out. This is a pretty big change, I think, and it'll take some learning for sure because I'm not very familiar with OAuth, but yeah, let's uh, hop right into it. I actually recorded a lot of clips of me implementing things, but every time I would talk about what I was going to do, I'd end up doing something completely different. So now I've implemented most of it and I'm just going to talk about like what I did. So basically now there's this extra button that got added to the uh, main menu called Google. And I'll eventually you probably use like a Google sign on image or something like that. But essentially how it works is in the game, you'll click the Google sign in button that redirects you to a login screen where you can authenticate with whichever account you want. If you have multiple, you'll just get to select the one you want to play with um, I need to enter my password now and then that redirects you back to the app and then signs you back in and how it works internally for the desktop app the app actually spins up a local host web service and uh, that local host web service waits for this redirect to happen uh, and a one-time password gets passed back from the authentication server which runs in the cloud so this one-time password gets passed back this gets used to basically authenticate for the first time to say that you are who you say you are once the app reconnects to the proxy it gets a long-term token that it can use to uh, re-authenticate you so that way if you exit the app and you rejoin in the app it'll uh, uh, keep you logged in and then also now that i've logged in in the browser at least one time you can go to the, the browser page this is just a local one and it'll automatically authenticate you because it's using the same exact token on the browser version how it works is basically a json web token gets stored as a cookie and that is used to authenticate the player when they join so that way when you refresh the page it will just log you back in automatically and if you log out it's going to clear that cookie and then you can log in with a different account and then obviously you can log in as a guest if you want on the browser as well and uh, how i do account persisting is when the user logs in i read their data from the database and when the user logs out i write their data to the database uh, this isn't a perfect solution and i'll probably will change it in the future I'll probably have some kind of checkpointing system along the way. That way, if the game does happen to crash, at least they'll only lose like 10 minutes of progress or one minute of progress, depending on what kind of time frame I decide to use. But yeah, I'm pretty happy with this right now. It is nice to be able to persist items and it is nice to have user accounts and things like that. There's still a lot of changes I have to do for how I'm going to actually store the data in the Docker image. So I need to set up that stuff next. That'll be a little bit of uh, work in making the Docker configs correct. Like I need to have persistent volumes for the Docker images that contain databases inside of them. So that's one big change I need to do still. And that might be the next change that I work on. All right, I had the strangest bug. So I thought I would just talk about it really quick. The client was crashing because was actually trying to draw too many health bricks. I guess how I, how I set up the health component is once I started adding stats, the health gets recalculated based off of the stats of the entity. So as a default, I just picked a, picked a max int. That way I would always be reducing the health and that way it would uh, always be full when it gets recalculated. The problem was that uh, for the player, we draw out individual health bricks for based on how many health they have. So if you're drawing the max integer number of health bricks, that takes a very long time. It ends up using up all of my RAM, kept crashing my game. I was finally able to figure this out. Anyways, I will fix that and then I will come back and finish showing my little demo. Welcome back everybody. Originally what I was planning to do for my database was I was planning to just store local files in each Docker image, but I'm starting to realize that that's just not going to work because my architecture is already distributed enough to separate like the proxy from the server. It's really hard to have data held in one Docker image that's inaccessible from another one. If you think about how it's going to scale in the future like eventually i'm going to have some database somewhere and uh, every service that needs to access user data will just access that one database what I think I'm going to do right now is I'm going to migrate my local database just to one new Docker image, which will be a Redis instance with some sort of persistence enabled. It looks like there are two different methods of persistence, and then there's a combination method as well. Uh, there's RDB, which does snapshotting of your data to a file, and there's append only, which presumably gives you like more robustness if there's just a hard failure of your server, because it's just appending to a log file. And then I guess you can do the combination of both of those. Uh, my data is such that if I lose the latest snapshot but i get the snapshot from like a minute ago then that's probably good enough so i'm not going to worry about it too much and so yeah there's a there's a little guide on how to use redis i've done redis before uh, it's been a long long time so we'll have to learn a little bit i think so yeah 
I will work on this and uh, I'll let you know what I come up with. Well, that was actually a lot easier to set up than I thought it was going to be. And actually, I learned that Redis has this nice thing called Redis Insights, which is just like a uh, GUI server that you can use to access and look at all the stuff in your Redis store. So I just made like a little test key with a little bit of data in here to store the value. But uh, yeah, this is super nice. And uh, yeah, now all I have to do is replace my local database with Redis calls and I think I'll be good. So I guess let's try to get these uh, things wired together and I'll check back in with you once I have them wired up. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, I just finished integrating with Redis. I got most of the things I wanted to get done completed. So basically what the account creation process looks like is you will click this and then it'll authenticate and you can close this page now. And if I refresh the page, you can see that a few keys got added. One key is for the user ID counter and this is just an atomically incrementing number uh, that is used to determine what the next user ID is going to be. And then this is just a mapping from the uh, OAuth ID to the internal ID. So this one just says that this OAuth ID is gonna map to this user ID. And that's just for the auth portion. Um, and as you can tell, I do a little prefixing of all of my keys because Redis is very simple. So it just has a key value store for global keys. I just use the word global for the ID counter, for example. For auth, I'm going to prefix it with auth. And then for user data, I'm going to prefix it with user dot and then the uh, user ID. So let me now log in. And then currently uh, there won't be anything saved because the account hasn't been persisted. But if I log out, it'll save the, or if I exit, uh, it'll save that user to the database. And then now they will be saved. So user one has this stuff in their equipment and this stuff in their inventory. And I can join back in, move stuff around a little bit, or we'll just unequip the, the weapon. Then if I leave again, and then I refresh this, you'll see the equipment now, nothing's equipped. And I can obviously like join Going back in, re-equip it, leave, and now the weapon will be re-equipped. So there you go. And so yeah, that's basically how that works. Um I think this is actually gonna work pretty well. I'm pretty happy with this. I do need to add persistence now, but that's just a simple config that needs to be added on. But at this point, I basically have a global data store for all of my game data, which is fairly nice. There's things that can improve, I guess, but uh, I think this is a good start. I think this is good enough to deploy as soon as I get the Docker Compose set up with persistence, uh, then I should be good. I, uh, I'm gonna do a slight detour. I was working on the user auth stuff and setting up Redis for my Docker containers, but... Uh, I got this comment on my YouTube video. I thought it was kind of funny. Uh, I tried playing it, but it's too laggy on Ubuntu, Chrome. Time to rewrite it in Rust. Then I went to my game and uh, they are definitely right. There's tons of lag happening right now. When you walk around and stuff like that and you go into a dungeon, uh, things just jump around. You take damage when you shouldn't be. It's just kind of like generally very, very skippy. So something's going on with this that I need to fix. Luckily, I do have Grafana and Prometheus tracking a bunch of metrics. So I was looking at that. I was able to narrow it down to the game server was having issues. And as you can see here, there's a lot of weird heap memory issues happening. Uh, there's something that's like allocating a bunch and then it's getting garbage collected. And you can tell that my number of live objects is increasing dramatically. If you do like a five minute view, you can tell I'm allocating almost a million objects every single minute, which is obviously not good. And if you go to a longer view, you can see when this all started, it started on two days ago, it looks like. So I'm not sure exactly what caused that, but clearly something's gone wrong here. I'm happy that all this work I spent time on to get this metrics uh, set up, it actually paid off a little bit because now I can do some quick analysis and narrow down very quickly what was going wrong. I don't know the exact underlying root cause of this yet, so I'll look for that and then I'll let you know what it is and then we will fix it and hopefully this will go back to being stable again. All right, I was looking a little bit more into this. Uh, I restarted the server. I was just looking at uh, how things changed and uh, this is not, this is never really a good sign to see a bunch of things drop when you turn it off because uh, it usually means you have some kind of resource leak. So on the proxy, it looks like I am leaking some things that are doing a lot of extra allocations. And uh, it also looks like I'm uh, leaking Go routines as well. So as you can see, after it ran for a while, it was at like uh, almost 250. Then I restart and it drops down to uh, uh, 40. So there must be something in here which is not uh, cleaning up Go routines. And that's for the proxy. Then for the server, uh, the same kind of thing happens where you have a ton of uh, live objects that just uh, immediately falls off a cliff once you restart the server. The total amount of allocated memory does drop from 1.24 gigabytes to 50 megabytes, uh, which is a big drop. Clearly something's going on here. So let me look at this and I will let you know what happens. I was able to fix what I think are the issues involved with the memory leak part. Uh, what I ended up doing was uh, I was generating kind of like a large number of different Prometheus labels, one per dungeon ID. And uh, what I ended up doing was reducing that to dungeon type. 
Yeah, it was mostly just that and the, the LDTK file getting loaded every single time a dungeon got created. That was just allocating a lot of unnecessary memory. So yeah, I think everything's good. I did actually also go ahead and add in pprof profiling. Go has this nice feature where you can host a pprof server on your binary. So I added that. I think I mentioned this earlier, but I added that to my server and my proxy. Uh, and that was able to let me in production check what's using or what's doing the most allocations and uh, also what's doing or using the most performance. So it's a lot of good data to have. So if you do run uh, servers in the cloud or whatever, then I do highly recommend doing this. And it's very easy to set up. There was an article is called like, uh, it's like continuous profiling and go. Uh, which talks about it a little bit. They talk about using the uh, Google Cloud Profiler. I think it's a little bit more usable, but I think it's the same kind of data. It's uh, what's doing allocations. I think it integrates with the Google Cloud platform, uh, which I don't use, so uh, it's not super useful for me. But yeah, uh, this was the article I read that made me think about doing this idea in the first place. So it's a nice article to read and it gave me a lot of insight. So I'm happy that I added this uh, and I think the overhead's fairly low. I think in her article, she mentions uh, they target 5%. Yeah, we target an additional 5% overhead for CPU and heap allocation profiling. It's nice. I recommend it. Uh, if you do do this sort of thing, good to check out and maybe you'll like it too. All right. Another little update. Um, I wanted to make it like these smaller buttons, you know, and I just had Google off, so it didn't look very good with just one or two. So I figured I'd add steam as well. So now there's two auth, OAuth uh, targets you can use um, and then guest auth if you just want to play and try it out or whatever and don't want to make an account. I got kind of tired of telling people to, hey, make sure you uh, refresh your cache uh, when they reload the game. So what I ended up doing was configuring Firebase to set the cache control uh, max age to 60 seconds rather than the default. Uh, if you don't know, Firebase has uh, e tags enabled for their CDN. So um, basically what will happen now is you'll get a 304 response, which basically means that the content hasn't changed because I think what how it works is uh, you send the e tag inside of your uh, HTTP request to download the content. The CDN basically says, hey, the, the e tag is the same still, so the content hasn't changed. Uh, so you can just use the cached version that you have. So that's how that'll work now. So as long as you're not within the one minute window of this uh, binary changing, you'll just get the cached version. So that way people don't have to worry about disabling their cache and I can finally uncheck this box up here so that'll be nice. That's all I have for this week. As always an absolutely massive thank you to all the supporters on YouTube, GitHub, and Patreon. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.